Well, I'd like you to imagine something with me. And if you need to maybe close your eyes or something, feel free to do so. But imagine yourself at the age of 34. Now, this is an age where you still kind of identify with being in your 20s. Maybe you're still relatively physically active, race the occasional 5K or 10K, and you are a mover and shaker at your Silicon Valley-based company. And you are about to go on a 10-day ski vacation to Breckenridge, Colorado, where you have promised yourself that you are not going to check your email or take any work calls while you are on this trip, which I know is like completely unheard of in Silicon Valley, right? Well, seven days into that 10-day vacation, you come in from a morning of sled riding with friends, and you start to feel an uncomfortable pressure in the center of your chest. Okay, that's different. And then a tingling sensation begins radiating down your left arm. Okay, that's really strange. What would you think? What would you do? Would you alert your family? Would you call 911? Would you pray? Well, here's what I did. I simply asked my husband where the aspirin was. I took two aspirin and my symptoms went away and we went on about our weekend. You see, that was Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving 2014. Two days later, I woke up from sleep with the exact same symptoms. But did I tell anybody? No, I went in the bathroom, I shut the door, and I sat down on the edge of the bathtub, and I thought, I want to see if my strong, healthy body can resolve these symptoms without the aid of the aspirin. Well, my symptoms did not go away, and thankfully, my husband realized I hadn't come back to bed, and he called out to me, and he insisted that we go to the emergency room. I, of course, refused. I took two more aspirin, and I'm like, hey, I'm fine. You know, this is our last day to go skiing. I'll, I'll go see a doctor when we get back to, to California. So my family, uh, my parents, were there with us um, for the latter part of, of this vacation, and we all sat down to breakfast together, and all the while, my husband, Jeremiah, is insisting that I go to the emergency room. If I'm having chest pain, I need to go to the emergency room but I continued to refuse. And at the end of breakfast, we did a little Bible reading together as a family, and that still small voice inside my head, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit, said to me, Becky, listen to your husband. Go to the emergency room. (laughs) So off to the emergency room, my husband and I went. They quickly took me back and ran the tests, and when the doctor came in to our room, He looked at us and he said, well, the tests aren't conclusive that you've had a heart attack, but there are enough abnormalities in the test results that we need to send you down to Denver by ambulance for further testing that we can't do up here in the mountains. My husband and I both looked at each other and we we began to well up in tears, but we also wanted to be strong for the other person. You see, my consistent physical health had long been a reliable component of our relationship, and the thought of losing my health shattered my vision of our future together. And in that room, my world stopped. Well, on that two-hour ambulance ride down to Denver, I constantly worried what my husband was thinking and feeling. You see, he had to sit up front while I was in the back with the EMTs. I just wanted to reassure him that everything was going to be fine. We would go in for this final test, get some answers, and come out with an action plan. I was in denial that I could have suffered not just one, but two heart attacks. You see, I'm an accountant by trade. I work in finance, and my life, my personal life, my work life are all organized in spreadsheets, and for me, this just did not add up. Well, the next day, I suffered a third and nearly fatal heart attack during a routine cardiac catheterization test. All three of my main coronary arteries showed tears in the inner lining, a condition called spontaneous coronary artery dissection, or SCAD, and doctors struggled to stabilize me. They kept me in a drug-induced coma, and after what I'm sure were multiple agonizing hours for my family, finally concluded that I needed to be transferred across town from the west side of Denver to the east side of Denver, not by ambulance, but by helicopter 
to a hospital with the technology and the experience to save my life. And when we got to that hospital, the doctors told my family that my chances of survival were 20, maybe 30 percent. It was there that it became clear that I would need a new heart if I were to live. This forecast felt like foreshadowing the final moments of my relatively younger life, and my husband begged those doctors to wake me up so that he could say all the things that he wished he would have said before I went in for that final test. Well, one night in the hospital, while we're waiting for news of a new heart, I had a very clear dream. And in this dream, Jesus told me that we needed to prepare for a two-month wait before he would deliver the right heart. And I argued with him, and I said, God, I don't know if I can physically make it two more months, but also I don't know if my family can emotionally handle the stress of every single day waiting in the hospital wondering if today's going to be the day that we get that new heart. But he reassured me that we could handle it and we needed to trust him. So the next morning, I stepped out in faith and I told my family to prepare for that two-month wait. But I also know the power of prayer. So my husband and I put out a plea on social media asking people to increase the fervor with which they were interceding with God on our behalf to deliver a new heart sooner. And the very next day, one of the cardiologists walked into my room with a glow on his face, and I asked him, do we have a new heart? And he said, yes, we have a new heart. I will tell you, I wanted to shout from the top of those rocky mountains that God had answered our prayers. There is still a future for me here, for us here. Well, it's not uncommon for people who know me to say, it's not fair that this happened to a good person like you, a healthy person like you. How many of you have seen the movie Office Space? Show of hands. How many? Yeah, one of the classic Office movies, right? Well, if you recall, this hypnotherapist, during a therapy session, a hypnosis session, he actually suffers a heart attack. And he's clenching, he's clenching his hand, he's grabbing at his chest, he's sweating profusely, he gets some short breaths, and then he just dies in the middle of this therapy session. Well, that was my image of what a heart attack would be like. That's what you see in the movies, right? And he also epitomized my image of the typical heart attack victim, an older, overweight male. But why do we assume that heart attacks discriminate? As a 34-year-old woman who ran Division I college track and cross-country, maintained a healthy weight and diet, and never took even one puff of a cigarette immune from suffering a heart attack? Well, I thought so, and now I have a new heart. Now, heart disease is an equal opportunity killer. And through organizations like the American Heart Association and their Go Red for Women movement, awareness is improving. And we know now that heart disease is the number one killer of women in America, by far more than all cancers combined. One out of three women will lose their life to heart disease in the U.S., well, I'm very blessed to also be on the board of an organization called SCAD Alliance. You remember I mentioned that the type of heart condition that I had is called SCAD. And this organization focuses specifically on advancing the science of SCAD and supporting families and survivors. And so I want to tell you a little story about the founder of this organization, Catherine Leon. Probably about eight years ago, she organized a group of 70 women who had suffered from SCAD and went to the Mayo Clinic and said, why aren't you researching this? And the response that they received is, well, there's just not enough cases. It's too rare to research. 
Well, thankfully, Catherine persisted and did eventually convince the Mayo Clinic to start doing research. And now they actually have an entire practice area that focuses specifically on research and treatment of SCAD. I also had the opportunity to connect SCAD Alliance and Stanford's Women's Heart Health Clinic this year to put together the first ever, the first annual SCAD patient retreat. This was such an amazing event. I'm so proud of how this went off. It was a full day event for 100 attendees, completely free to them to come and hear from the leading researchers. What do we know? What do we not know? How can you help participate in research? What are coping skills? How can we connect with each other to help each other through this difficult disease because we don't know what causes it. The medical community doesn't know the causes, and so we don't know how to prevent recurrence. So I believe that when we've had our lives restored, we have an obligation, a joyous obligation, to make a difference with our renewed lives. And certainly sharing our stories can help drive patient research and collaboration and awareness. And when others see the success that we have, it gives hope to those who are suffering from lesser known medical conditions. You know, I will never know if delaying medical treatment sealed the fate of my original heart. But if it weren't for my husband insisting that I get to the emergency room, I would not be up here on stage with all of you today. So can we give Jeremiah here a round of applause? If a group of 70 women can convince the Mayo Clinic to start research in their area, certainly nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. And if this group of organ transplant recipients from Northern California can win the Team Cup at the transplant games, which just happened this week, by the way. (laughs) So I know I'm kind of throwing this in here out of left field, but it was such a fun event. I couldn't not mention it. Um, My first transplant games ever. That could be a whole nother talk. But everything is possible with God. And I love this quote from Mark chapter 9, and this is where Mark is detailing one of Jesus' miracles, where a father brings his son, who's demon-possessed, to Jesus. And he's having this conversation with Jesus, and, and Jesus is asking him, well, how long has he been like this and whatnot? And the father says to Jesus, but if you can do anything, anything, please take pity on us and help us. And Jesus replies, if you can, like really? Yeah. Everything is possible for one who believes. So I'm going to ask you all to do something with me today. I want you to sing a song with me. It's a song that you all know the words to, this little light of mine. Okay? And we don't want to just hear my words, So, because I'm not that great of a singer. So are you all ready? All right, here we go. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Jesus, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. shine. So if the Holy Spirit has been whispering in your ear, now is the time to take action on whatever it is he's been talking to you about. Thank you.